On this week's episode, we're going to discuss an open source, decentralized mesh network you're absolutely going to want to be a part of. Welcome to Destination Linux, where we discuss the latest news, hot topics, gaming, mobile, and all things open source in Linux. My name is Ryan. I'm Wendy. <laughs> Where's Michael? Oh, I thought you forgot to speak, Jill. You're, are you sad? Are you missing Michael? Oh, truthful, truthfully, I am. Because you know what? I've never done a show without him. This is the second time now I've done a show without Isn't him. Isn't it wonderful, Jill? Yeah. It's so good. Oh, Wendy's killing it. Uh, no, for those who want to know, Michael is moving. So he is uh, yeah. extraordinarily overwhelmed. If you've ever moved, which I'm sure all of you have. You know what a disaster moving is. And not and just a couple miles down the road. He's hopping to state, another state. So that boy is busy. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. Busy. Yeah. So he will be back eventually. Uh, but for now, we have the glorious, amazing Wendy from Linux Out Loud and <laughs> joining us here, also the editor of the show. So yeah. when you see all the amazing yeah. uh, video of her <laughs> when she pops up like faces on top of me and stuff randomly. <laughs> That's Wendy. Wendy. That's the one that does it. That's the sinister <laughs> Wendy right there. All right. Also on this week, we're going to discuss some major changes coming to the Google Play Store for Android. I think it's going to be positive. It'll be interesting to see what you all think. Plus, we got some Linux gaming, software spotlight, and more. Let's get this show on the road toward Destination Linux. Our feedback this week comes from Jason. And Jason has this to say, it was interesting hearing your thoughts on WSL. I think the best way to view WSL is as a developer tool and not a normal end user tool. As a developer, I need a desktop environment that works with a bunch of proprietary apps, but I also need to be able to develop, debug, and deploy software I'm writing to a Linux environment. WSL is perfect for this because the server services we create are deployed to Kubernetes, i.e., no need for a Linux desktop at all. Additionally, the Windows version of Docker Desktop uses WSL and integrates seamlessly with various IDEs, allowing me to transparently deploy to and debug on a Linux server. It's much better using my local super powerful desktop than having to connect to some remote server to do the same. So, Jill, what's your take on this? Oh, um, I think Jason is absolutely correct. You know, I know a lot of other developers and IT admins that say the same thing, that WSL also makes their lives easier because they can stay on one OS. I know my brother uses it for that reason as an IT admin. And uh, we, you know, when we talked about it, we were... Uh, we did mention that, you know, it has a developer focus, but initially it was also supposed to be for the end user. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that really never happened it, to make the, the GUI install easier. It just, it, it never happened. It's, it's quite complex to use. So it's just stayed in the hands of developers. Right. Which is good. <laughs> which is Wendy, fine. what's your take? You know, if you have ever watched LOL, uh, we're pretty big on there that use the tool for the job. So whether that's whatever DE yeah. is best for you, whatever distro is best for you, all of that has been the same. And I use my fair share of proprietary apps on Linux. So if this is the tool for you to get the job done in order to develop for Linux, bring us the software to Linux. Yeah. It's interesting because I think... When the person sent, this is in response to some feedback, the initial discussion we had recently was a, a community feedback and it was somebody saying, hey, I think WSL is, you know, there to kind of Microsoft to take over for Linux essentially and hide the fact that it's Linux behind the scenes. And our take was, at least my take was, yeah, I agreed back then when they first started talking about WSL. Uh, number one, I was disappointed as I recall that Canonical was investing their own developers to help develop for this because Microsoft's got some big pockets. They can kind of do that on their own. Um, but the other thing was just the, the aggressiveness that they were going about implementing things. So it wasn't at the time uh, the individual we had on from, I believe, Microsoft to talk about this that was working on it was talking about doing all of these things where they were going to make basically the GUI interface, everything that you come to know 
uh, of running Linux capable on a Windows machine. So if you installed these pieces of software, it essentially would have been the seamless integration where you didn't even know you were running a Linux app and it would just run on Windows behind the scenes and those type of things. Again, as I recall, this was a long time ago, but one of those episodes, like probably in the 200 area, maybe even the 100 area yeah. where all that was happening. <laughs> so um, I, that's what I was saying. I agreed with them back then. What WSL has become is a lot of those ambitions dropped and it really just became a developer's tool. And for that, I don't really see any threat from it. I think any IT admin mm -hmm. who's utilizing it uh, understands they're utilizing Linux. There's nothing being hidden about it being Linux. And it's a pain in the butt to get up and running from a normal mm -hmm. user standpoint. It's not like you just go to the Windows App Store and click Ubuntu and boom, it's there. You've got to go in through all these settings and enable Linux and do all this stuff to get WSL to work correctly. So I think what it became is something that, uh, if anything, will probably bring more people into the Linux world or, or seeing the power of it from the terminal aspect and from admins, that's okay. Uh, for other people, if they happen to accidentally trip and be like, I want to try Linux and see Ubuntu in the Windows store and go through all those steps and then all they see is a terminal, then that makes me sad because that may be what they think Linux is, is just a terminal. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there's that problem, but I think that's a very small minority of people that will run into that. So, no, I love the clarification, Jason. Thank you for sending yes. this in. I think sometimes when we're telling stories, we assume everybody's heard everything up to 300 episodes. And so <laughs> uh, it can miss some context there. But I absolutely agree. Uh, use the tool that's right for you, number one, even if that is Windows. Uh, number two, WSL has been a fantastic tool for a lot of developers out there. They don't have to dual boot. They don't have to reboot. And they have to use Windows as their primary system or they want to use Windows as their primary system. And that certainly is their choice. Not a great choice, but it's their choice. You, know? mm -hmm. you allow people to make mistakes. You just got to let them. You got to let them make mistakes. Uh, this is why we love our community and our community feedback. If you want to send in your questions, comments, feedback on the show, go to destinationlinux.net slash comments. You help make part of this show. Every week we do community feedback because of awesome people like you that take the time to send us these notes in. And then you get to help form part of the show every single time. So we love your comments. Also, you can go on destinationlinux.net slash forum if you want to post it in the forum and get other community members' feedback on your post there. So thank you very much, Jason, for that. So I am very excited about this next topic. This is one of those things that I just absolutely geeked out over when I heard it. And one of those situations where I spent money I had not budgeted or planned to spend immediately upon hearing this news. So one of our patrons in our chat, long-term patron, Alex, uh, came to our show last week and introduced us to one of the coolest devices. And I'm just so excited to share this with the community, number one, because you all have to make the same financial mistake I made, which is not budgeting anything and just buying stuff and going and getting this device so we can all play with this thing. Um, the idea is so cool. It's not necessarily new, um, but it's starting to pick up in a really big way. Like when we were going through this service that I'm being very obscure about right now, uh, we were looking at all these states and there were just thousands of these devices out there, which made me super, super excited um, to pick one up. And so there's a website called Meshtastic and we'll have a link in the show notes to it, or you can, you know, utilize DuckDuckGo. It's probably scrolling on the screen right now. There you <laughs> there go. We go. Our editor's <laughs> so good. Our editor's <laughs> on point. Um, and what they're setting up at Meshtastic is an open source, off the grid, decentralized. All these words I love, by the way. Mm -hmm. These are all mm -hmm. the words I want to hear when I'm talking about a new product. Off these the are grid, key decentralized. Words to make Ryan excited. You just get him all Man. sorts of giddy with these keywords. Dude, so many geek squeals going on. Right <laughs> now. I got geek bumps. I got all kinds of things going on. All right. So. Uh, and then mesh network. So it's a mesh network, open source, off grid, decentralized mesh network. So think when we're talking about this, like ham radio world, but without all the licensing nonsense. And I know there's probably somebody who's going to be like, no, there's a reason for the license. I get that because, you know, you can interrupt other trap, all that stuff. But what I mean, nonsense is you got to study for this thing. You got to go, you know, set up an appointment to take a test. And a lot of the stuff you're taking a test on is not like, 
in my opinion, when I was kind of studying for it, it wasn't super interesting anymore. Ugh, and isn't the and equipment to get started more on the expensive side still? It's very, It can be very expensive. I think you get a lot of used stuff, but if you want to have like a good time with ham radio, it gets pretty pricey out there. But I'm, I'm sure there's reasons for all that. I'm not knocking ham radio. Ham radio is awesome. And if anything ever happens to networks and stuff, that's what a lot of people will be using to communicate. But there's another option here that everyone can do without a license. And it's a way to keep communication going in case the centralized internet as we know it was to go down or be interrupted or just because you want to send messages and things to people uh, all around and not utilize the standard internet for it. So if you're a prepper, you could obviously see the cool opportunities here. If you're someone who's just a geek and wants to play with new toys, there's lots of awesome opportunities here. Uh, and if you're someone who's a privacy, big privacy enthusiast, Again, there's just everyone wins here. There's no losers in this meshtastic thing. So beyond that, it's a cool way to meet new people as well. This is already quite huge, as I mentioned. And the best part, it's built to run on very affordable, low power devices. So no ultra expensive equipment or software licenses for those who do ham radio through their computer required here. And the more people, then the more hops we get in our mesh network and the more people we can communicate with. Theoretically, we could build our own little network here, our own internet, and we'll make it good this time with a lot more cat memes. That's the ticket. <laughs> yeah. A lot more cat memes. And yeah. no RGB, Wendy. We're going to make an internet for you, Wendy. Oh, no RGB I love and it. lots of cat okay, memes. Okay, so no RGB. Instead of the cat memes, we could keep the no RGB and at mm -hmm, the same mm -hmm. time add some Lord of the Rings memes. Maybe some Lord Deadpool of the memes. Rings. Oh, Deadpool. I like that. Yeah, one. yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. Did you hear that? Um, you know, the Justin Timberlake song, the bye, bye, bye was in sync <laughs> that the kids now call it the Deadpool song. Like they don't oh, even yeah. know it. They as, don't even know. Uh, the original. Yeah. I know <laughs> I was rolling in the theater when it was on and I'm oh. typically not someone who's big into the cosplay stuff, but I've decided with all of the maker stuff I have now, I need a Deadpool mask and a Wolverine yeah. mask and they're yeah. going to be mounted over here where you guys can see them. Yes. That pull is, is really good. Jill, have you seen it yet? <laughs> no, I haven't. I've been wanting to. Oh, oh it was so good. <laughs> good. It's so good. It's worth it. Like going to a movie is an investment now. Uh -huh. Like it costs more than this device we're about to talk about to mm -hmm. go see a movie with a family of four. <laughs> so it has to be like something really special. This Deadpool and Wolverine is worth it. It's like it's really worth it. It's really good uh if you go to the movies. So all right, we're talking about this mesh network. Mm -hmm. Um and we're going to create an internet for Wendy. And, and Jill, we'll have all happy stuff on there. No more sad stuff on the internet. On our internet, it will all be happy, yeah. joyful things. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Now you're doing promises that you, there's just no way you can fulfill. Like, no way. <laughs> you're correct. Because it's decentralized. Everyone could do what they want. Exactly. But, you know. Hey, I would like a mishtastic BBS. That would be awesome. Oh. Ah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> So the more people that get this device, the cooler it's going to be. But there was like in California, Jill, wasn't there like 1,500 of yes. these devices deployed there? Yeah. Um, like there were hundreds and hundreds of devices all over wow. the United States. There were a couple states with none or very few. But for the most part, it was pretty packed, which yeah. is cool. Like I didn't packed. know this would take off and that many people would already have them. So it's not like just three people in the world will have it. Plus me and Alex – uh might already have <laughs> one. So mine already arrived between last week when I ordered it immediately after the show and this week. Um, you know, I haven't really gotten to use it because I refuse to read a manual. I did set it up. I got the app working. Uh, it's connected. Everything is there to start communicating, except uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next to communicate. And Alex actually is in our patron chat right now figuring that out to tell me because I refuse to read a manual uh, and so I'm so thankful to the community. I keep that. telling him to read the manual and he just <laughs> won't do it. Like, how do I do this? Read the manual. But I don't want to. How do I do this? Read the manual. No. It's so It's like it's dealing so with a toddler. Yeah. It's such defeat to read a manual. <laughs> Ryan is an auditory and visual learner. That Thank I you, know. Jill. That's, that's right. Yes. That's right. And I get that. Percent because I definitely learn better through books. Like, and I'm an audio book person. I'm typically not a reader, oh, I like so I understand books. that. But you know, 
There is a manual. Read the read the doing manual. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that butt meant. That's a that's a mom look right there that I'm very familiar with. But do it anyways. Is what I'm telling you. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll get around to it. But thankfully, I have community members who will do all the work and then do it for me, and then he'll tell me how, and then I won't have to worry about it. And Ryan and, will take the credit of using yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be like, I've never had to read the manual. I'm just so, <laughs> those born so intelligent. I know what Alex can community. do. He could put them in the show notes and then you would be forced Ooh. to read them. <laughs> oh, that would be so rude. That would be so rude. <laughs> hey, send me the link to the manual. <laughs> the instruction manual. I'll add it to the show notes. So what this network <laughs> is, is primarily a chat network, but there are optional GPS location options. And of course, with this type of thing, once it's set up, the world is the limit. You can mm -hmm. transmit uh, technically all kinds of things through it, depending on how many nodes you get set up and uh, the data transmission, the type of devices. But you can get started in this really cheaply. But I want to talk about real quick how this works. So Meshtastic utilizes what they call LoRa, L-O-R-A, which is a long range radio protocol which is widely accessible in most regions without the need of license or certi certifications, like we mentioned on like CAM. And these radios are designed to rebroadcast messages they receive, forming the mesh network. So as it hits different hops, they're all rebroadcasting that message around until the person who's intended gets that message, which is really cool. Um, and this setup ensures that every member, including those at the furthest distance, can receive messages. Additionally, Mestastic radios can be paired with a single phone, allowing friends and family to send messages directly to your radio. So I've got the app set up on my phone. The app connects to this little tiny device here. Isn't it cute, by the way? I mean, it's adorable. It's, it's adorbs. And it's Ryan adorbs. got a green one because he's DOS geek. That's right. See? Okay, so I have to tell you that when I was reading the specs of this device, I was super excited because they were actually using a filament that has the carbon fiber in it. So that's not only making it a little bit lighter, but stronger. So this should actually be able to take, I mean, I wouldn't want to go smash it with a rock, but it would help it be able to take a hit as you're out and about using it. It's really interesting you say that because when I saw the original picture of it, I figured, oh, this guy's just 3D printing these cases, which is fine for me. Yeah. He's got a single board computer. Mm -hmm. He's 3D printing a mm -hmm. case and putting an antenna on it. But when I got it and held it in my hand, I'm like, wow, this thing is very, it feels like steel. Yeah. It does not feel like a typical yeah, nice 3D solid. printed plastic. It's super solid. This is absolutely rugged. You could definitely take this in the woods with you or wherever right. you're going and not worry about breaking it. It's just really well designed that way. So yeah, I'm very happy with um, what they've done here and USB-C charging. So they went to universal USB-C, which I can always appreciate uh, for these. Uh, there's also a map that we'll have in the show notes so you can see all the nodes near you. It's meshmap.net, and there are multiple radios. If you want to get started, this one is 79 bucks, but you can get started for as little as $29. You don't have to get this kit. I went a little crazy. Uh, don't tell my wife, but um, I got this one that was a little more expensive. I said this was the cheapest one, but... Hopefully she doesn't listen did. to this show. Uh, yeah. I'll defend you because it's still a lot cheaper than ham. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, and then cheaper than getting a new phone. Or if you're looking at yeah. just getting a really, really good set of two-way radios, you're still within that price range. Yeah, absolutely. See? Man, y'all are the best. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> there's several different devices. You don't have to go with this one. This is the Helltech V3 running Meshtastic. Uh, you can go to muzi.works. And check out the ones that they have. That's where I got this. But there's the Rack Mishtastic Start Kit. There's a Station G1, Lily Go, Laura T3S3, and the Helltech Laura V3 like this one here. Um, so there's lots of different options. Different colors, too. So you get mm -hmm. the whole, like, hey, new yeah. iPhones launch. Guess what's new? Better screen, better battery, and new color that people go crazy about. It's so wild to me that people Weird. care and then they put a case on it and cover it up anyways it's like, <laughs> hey i have to have the pink and i put a black case on it. some of us get d brand <laughs> skins so that you look can at see. that this is their x-ray skin yeah some of us oh get that's it. dope that's and then you is that the one case. plus this is the one there? plus 12 yes nice I bet that has a really good camera. In it, it has a killer camera for a cell phone yes it's look very good look at that coming from a professional photographer <laughs> that means something there I said it wouldn't mean nothing. All, right. All I do is take selfies. But for I thought other that people, was Michael. But... You just outed yourself. Yeah, yeah Michael. 
Do what happens? I feel like this is confession all of a sudden. I'm getting in trouble. <laughs> no, you're not all in right. trouble. I'll just use it against you later. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Sinister Wendy. <laughs> Sinister Wendy on attack. All right, Jill, I've got to know your take on this. Like you've yeah. seen all of, like I have growing up, I've seen all the communication methods change, how we text each other, all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on this particular device and what they're trying to accomplish here? Okay, so I've known about the uh, uh, long-range radio protocol for some time, and there have been other companies that have kind of tried to create their own, but this one took off. Fantastic. Yeah. Really awesome. And I kind of look at it, Ryan, as the CB radio of the internet, Mm -hmm. because you you, you don't have to have a license to use it. And I used to have a CB radio in a car I couldn't drive that my parents bought me. (laughs) So the classic Cobra, (laughs) (laughs) but anyways, uh, where I actually live, you know, here in Southern California, we have a community called SoCal Mesh, which is working to build a network of Mesh-tastic radios like Ryan has. And one of its many uses though, is for alternate alternate forms of communication and emergencies like earthquakes and fires, et cetera. That's one of the reasons why you're seeing it, uh, uh, seeing a lot more nodes here in California. And my brother actually also has one of these uh, me- mishtastic radios. And he's also a ham radio operator who has assisted with b- big earthquakes in the past. And I've noticed a lot of hams are, are definitely getting into this. And I think that is just a fabulous thing. Another form of communication during an emergency is what we need. <laughs> And um, the other interesting thing is Meshtastic also supports the Raspberry Pi Pico with a wave share low RA mo- module. So, Oh, really? Uh, so you could set yeah. it up on a Raspberry Pi Pico? Yeah, that's what my brother did. He used um, the Pico with a, a, a long-range radio protocol module. So that means you could use existing equipment to potentially get all connected to all yeah this yeah so i'd actually pulled up the socal mesh website and one of the images that they have here has it communicating also with a laptop over USB-C, wi-fi or bluetooth mm-hmm. which is really yeah. cool yeah that's awesome yeah no, that's, j- that's something jill you mentioned the whole emergency services thing mm-hmm. that's amazing from the aspect mm-hmm. of, you know, when you think about a prepper who, you know, you could say, oh, they're all crazy until it all hits the fan. Then you're going to be like, oh, I wish I had a prep. Anyways, so the, the whole prepper premise of something is like to be prepared for a disaster. Right. And if you think about emergency services, if the internet yeah. cables were cut, uh, the internet went down for whatever reason, I don't know, something like uh, any type of uh, blast against anything not fiber optics, right, can knock out a lot of electronics. Or people losing like power because you have people dealing with power, blackouts, yes. brownouts in the United States and other parts of the world. So this is still a good way to have that communication. Yeah. Yep. And it's one of the reasons a lot of these devices are um, solar, especially here in California. We have a lot yeah. of it. Yeah, with with both the ham stations and and the long range radio. Nice. I've got to get solar because I live in Texas and it was 105 oh. degrees. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it was officially 105 degrees, but felt like 114, mm. which you know just feels like you're being cooked. Right. But I was thinking, man, I feel like I could power the world with one little solar panel on top of my house with this kind of heat coming down. <laughs> so, well, yeah, if you do want to get, get into solar, talk to Cubicle Nate. He has solar on his place. Of course he does. Of course, of course he Nate does. does. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that would be Nate, <laughs> Cubicle Nate's going to love this product. If you're oh, Linux out yeah. loud, man, absolutely. <laughs> but I know Nate will be on this network with me. I've got mine powered on, ready to go. And I'm just waiting if Alex would please hurry up and figure out how it works uh, so I don't have to read the manual. We could get going immediately on here. So this to me is a very exciting. Like, like we said at the beginning, this isn't brand new, but this is one that's taking off. And I want to ride that wave. I want to help this thing take off, which is why I want to bring it out to all of you in the community, Uh, whether you're going to buy a little kit for, you know, buy the board for just 29 bucks or buy yourself a kit. And you can keep upgrading your device too. You can get bigger antennas so you can start with a smaller kit and then slowly upgrade your device as you go. I think this is something everybody should be uh, getting on board with and, and, you know, using. 
What really has me the most interested is the fact that you can pair this with a phone or another device, like you talked about. Yeah. So right Laptop. now, Laptop. yeah, we have a device that communicates with satellites. So my husband can get emergencies out or whatever if he's between here and places that he goes in Nevada where there still is no cell phone access. There's huge stretches yeah. of Nevada yeah. that you can't get service, even though it's still pretty flat. Uh, there's just nothing out there in between towns. So I don't know that I would necessarily want to rely on this of, hey, SOS, I have a truck down. But as the network grows, it could potentially be a backup for that other device that we have, being able to get messages out both ways. Yeah. Nice. Good idea. Well, you've heard it here. Check out Miss Tastic. If you get one, let us know. We can message each other and do a little thing back and forth. You know, it's funny. You could do all the stuff you could do on this in your, in your phone much easier and all that, but it's not running on a decentralized mesh network. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so we'll be able to text. <laughs> it's like Privately. being all excited about the first cell phone again that could text. We're going to be able to text each other, y'all. And we get messages. to go back to the QWERTY keyboard or the Q9, T9 yeah. keyboards. There you go. I'm going to hit <laughs> eight, this- five times. <laughs> Eight, five times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I see this growing, though. I see the ability to transmit pictures, data, other things. Yeah, uh, that's coming. And, yeah, <laughs> I think it will be coming. The network just has to get too. bigger. We need more bandwidth across the devices. Mm-hmm. But. We need more people to just make the decision. Finances be darned. Go buy one right now. Check it out. All right, Wendy, what's happening in the news this week? Well, you got to cover the fun stuff, and you gave me the story that's not quite so fun. This one really is <laughs> so fun. Oh, yeah. I do write the show. Right? Yeah. yeah. You write the show. And he calls me sinister. So yeah. <laughs> we have some more bad news when it comes to an attack vector on both Mac and Linux at the same time. And this one can hit you through your browser, whether that's Safari, Chrome, Opera, Firefox, any of those This is a zero-day attack using the IP address 0.0.0.0 instead of using the localhost slash 127.0.0.1. So essentially, it turns your computer into a gateway for accessing local services through your browser. Now, yes. Very Mm -hmm. ugly, very nasty. Now, this zero string IP address serves for a variety of purposes, and most commonly, it represents all IP addresses. It's kind of a space filler there. And I've even seen it on devices that I've set up, Um, mainly my Fluid server. Not your Mesh No. Okay. Not my Mesh Tastic. Fluid server as kind of the the placeholder or being able to access your 3D printer server if you leave the mm-hmm. house. So that everything really in the local host basically mm-hmm. in your local Absolutely. Network, yeah. So the interesting thing is this cybersecurity firm and I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this. O L I G O Oligo? Oligo, something mm-hmm. like that. Know, yeah. Something we'll go with like it. that. That works. They're the one who's found this exploit. And it's being used across 100,000 websites that they know of so far. And it's malicious websites that are able to bypass the security of your browser through this interaction on your local network. Now, Safari has already patched it. And I don't typically like to say nice things about Apple. But in this (laughs) case, I'm kind of forced to because they have already patched it. That patches out. Now, Chrome is a little bit in the gray hour area. They have started rolling out the patch, and I believe it was in version 128, and it's going to be fully rolled out by 133 for them. Firefox is really in some muddy situations here because they're talking about patching it. Now, there is a layer that they have come to starting to implement a patch. And that is called layer. That would have been really epic if it was just layer. It's just layer. Yes. So it's kind of this fetch layer that is is communication between things is how some of those are processed from my understanding. If you know more about fetch and what it is, I'd love to hear from you because this is just a quick brief over, oh, look, Firefox is doing something. 
uh, something looks like it's kind of being done. It's in the works. It's in talk. Yeah, because the initial articles were kind of like, hey, uh, Chrome is patching this, working. Mm-hmm. They already got patches in place that are, are being rolled out. Safari's already patched it and rolled it out. And Firefox hasn't decided if they're going how they're going to handle it yet. That's how all of the whole news has been kind of handling this, which really puts Firefox looking in a bad light. Now, my understanding is that they fear fixing it and blocking 0.0.0, if that was their fix, would create compatibility issues. Like, Wendy, you said, hey, I have a server that communicates this way to my 3D printer and everything else. Um, So Firefox is thinking about the end user. But at the same time, I feel like in situations like this, first of all, I don't know that you have to block it entirely to fix this issue. Um, Certainly something... Uh, that uh, security experts are going to have to look at and figure out how are er, how is everybody else fixing this particular issue. Um, but to me, Firefox kind of getting out there in the news, everyone kind of put their official statement out there like, yeah, we're patching it. I think Firefox could have said, yeah, we're patching it. We're going to figure out the best way to do it for compatibility uh, versus saying like, oh, we don't know what we're going to do yet, which just really put them in bad light. Right. Once again, like once again, they look like they're not doing so great and you're leaving your customers exposed. So in these cases, it may be better to just put a mitigation patch in to stop this from happening Mm -hmm. and then going back and fixing that in order to get the compatibility back and letting users know like, hey, we had to make this drastic move because uh, people were getting their stuff stolen and their devices are being taken control of Mm -hmm. over the 0.0.0.0 situation. So there are plenty of ways they could have gone about it. I don't think, and maybe they uh, have a really good plan to fix it. It's just they didn't get that out to the media and it looks really bad. Yeah, yeah. There definitely could have been a disconnect between the team who's working on it and the media team who's putting that information out there. I would like to Very give likely. them. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd really like to give them the benefit of the doubt. What is it? The episode uh, two weeks ago, I spent a lot of time in post show defending Firefox from Yes, you right, did. giving you it were, all you kinds were, of crap. Oh, you were firing at me. Firing like, at I won't tell you what. <laughs> Firefox is faster in everything I do. If you're saying it between her teeth, just like this. Well, <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that that's accurate, but I'll just let you have your dream world. Okay. Anyway. Right. <laughs> so I would love to be able to give them the benefit of the doubt, but I'm not above saying yeah. that it, it doesn't look good. And I would love to have them come forth with some better information here pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it is really sad because, you know, at least if we're not hearing the right information, mm-hmm. you know, it hasn't come down the the pipeline yet uh, that they've actually done this because, you know, they were the, they were the ones that championed HTPPS. You know, we got, we got to remember that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, they championed a lot of great things. Yeah. A lot of great things. And so that the fact that they're not on top of this is a little sad, but that could also be due to laying off employees and, and not being quite organized. One division talking to yeah. another, like you yep. were saying earlier, Wendy. Yeah. Well, and I know in or- the articles, it said that this bug is actually 18 years old. So it also makes me wonder how deep is that embedded in some of the code and how to properly fix it so things do work properly. And maybe like- that's where there's some issues in Firefox. Yeah. It's on their WebKit back end. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is interesting that you can have something that exposes this many devices in such a big way exist for 18 years, Mm -hmm. right? It's not like they knew about the bug for 18 years. It's just this particular part of the code that can be uh, circumvented now to do this has been in there for 18 years. So maybe people have already been using it for years more secretly. And now, you know, some uh, script kiddies got a hold of it and put up thousands of websites to try to trick people, whatever they're trying to draw their attention to. And now people can get uh, some of their services taken over. But our tip and trick of the week is going to be in this section. We can tell you how to mitigate yourself against this. Number one, make sure you're validating the host header in requests uh, to guard against DNS rebinding attacks targeting local hosts. So what does this mean? Don't click links. That's really what this means. Like, Don't click random links and if you see a random link that's taking to localhost or one of those things, then you know it could be a site that's getting you there. 
Um, so if you're if you're doing some, you're not clicking the link, but you're kind of taking the URL and looking where is it going and stuff, and you see some local host stuff, that would be a clue that this is not a good thing to go running. What's interesting though is if I saw that, if I clicked the link, which I don't do, but if I clicked the link in an email or something like that, and it took me to a local host, I just think, oh, they they broke their own website, like, mm. but. The reality, you know what I mean? Like if it just went yeah. to my local host IP, I wouldn't, really wouldn't think anything of it uh, without reading this article. So it's very interesting. Also, it requires accepting HTTP because you know when you go to your local host, if you're doing the 127 or the 0, 0.0, it will come up and say, hey, this is unsecure and you have to go advanced and you have to push forward and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're not running local servers, definitely don't accept going to any non-HTTP site. And Frankly, I don't ever go to any non-HTTP site. And I've seen sites, big sites that go down at times mm. and they they lose their HTTPS. Oh, yeah. I've yeah. seen that too, Ryan. <laughs> I don't go to the sites. I don't click advanced yeah. and proceed because at that point, I don't know if they're compromised or not. Yeah. Like, I don't know if is it just their certificate expired or is the whole site compromised. So when you see those, don't proceed forward and uh, avoid browsing sus sites would also be see how I'm up down with the kids, Jill. I threw that. Yeah, you are. There. Yeah, it's us. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's I, awesome. I know all the kid lingo. In there. <laughs> what do you think, Jill? Oh boy. Well, actually, um, you guys said it all so well, but I just kind of wanted to define it a, a little differently because I know a zero dot zero dot zero dot zero is kind of confusing to people, and I've had students ask me exactly what it what is it. So, so when I learned it, you know, it was like in the, in the eighties and nineties. And, um, so this IP address, you know, it, it actually sounds very confusing, but what I was taught that it means this network. And here's how I would explain it to my students. It is like a placeholder that says insert address here until a valid and routable IP address is assigned. Ooh, yeah. that's a great way. So <laughs> that's what I used to tell my students. And nice. yeah, it's- That is it's, dangerous though. So that it is. you can basically put anything you want there, but people aren't supposed to be able to access it. Yeah, especially since so many Linux applications do access that. So yeah. oh, we, we got to be careful. A lot yeah. of a lot of the setting up a local server to test something and stuff yeah. utilize local host exactly. um, variables in there, so it can be uh, even even your router when it's doing its pinging and everything. It, yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> All right, so be cautious. You got your tips and tricks. Don't click links. Just like if you haven't learned that yet, just don't click links. Just type it in manually. Like you get an email from your bank. Okay, that's cool. Open a web browser, type in the bank, log in normally, and don't click any of the links in an email uh, or text message. I turn it off so that friends can't send me messages. We went through that tip and trick. Cannot send me media messages and things to my device and stuff like that because there's a lot of, of these um, viruses and also governmental spyware that's just based on getting a text to you. It, you don't even have to open it anymore. They can just send you this picture or stuff that has the load built into it and boom, you're compromised. So um, you got to know who you're communicating with. Unless you're on Meshtastic in which what's the worst they could do? Yeah. Send a little message to you. Uh, check out Meshtastic if you haven't already. <laughs> got a little device here. Don't know how to use it yet. Alex will let me know after the show. All right. <laughs> so in other news, we've got Google Play Store. We're talking about Mm -hmm. uh, devices here, your phones and messages. So some major changes are coming to Google Play Store due to a federal ruling that states that the Google Play Store, it was engaged in monopolistic practices, meaning they were a monopoly. And if you ever played Monopoly, you kind of understand what that means. Uh, Google argued in the four-week trial that opening Android up to allow third-party stores will increase malware which, you know, that's that's kind of the Apple argument of why they keep their ecosystem closed, right? It's, it's dangerous if we open it up there. Uh, however, this argument didn't seem to persuade anybody on Android, as it shouldn't, because it's not like the safest place on the planet anyways to being on Android. So uh, Donato told Google attorney Glenn Pomerantz, when you have a mountain built out of bad conduct, you're going to have to move that mountain uh, because Google's like, okay, if you're going to force us to make these changes, it's going to cost us like $600 million, which I think that's what the CEO probably makes an hour, uh, for some reason to allow for third-party app stores. And so I would love to see an itemized bill for that $600 because I really don't understand 
how it would cost six hundred million dollars yeah. for them to do that because you can do F Droid and stuff today. So I'm like, uh, I know what Just exactly are you spending six hundred million dollars on? <laughs> I hope it's security. I, I don't think so, but I would hope it's security and privacy and stuff to go around that. Yeah. Um, and the judge further added, the whole point is to grow a garden of competitive app stores. Uh, which I 100% agree mm -hmm. with. You know, mm -hmm. this this idea that we already have a duopoly, which is Apple and Android, and then they're able to lock down their stores so that they always get the money, like, and it's like 30% in a lot of cases, 20, 30% of the app purchases and things is just, it's ridiculous. There's no competition there. It's not a free market when they're able to lock stuff out like that. That's why there's monopoly laws to begin with. I don't know why Apple is not included in this. I know the EU is going after Apple and the making Apple open up their store, but I don't know why the same judge isn't throwing the, the same Apple into the same situation because I would say Apple's even worse. Like, oh. at least I can sideload F Droid, whereas right. Apple, I can't do nothing with that without really breaking the But device, I think it so. does set a precedent for them to be able to take this to Apple Hopefully. and be like, okay, yeah. Yeah. it's your turn too. Yep. Yeah, and I was thinking exactly the same thing, Ryan. You know, when I was reading this article, why no Apple app, app Store mention? And it is good news for F Droid. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, one of our our, our favorite side loaded repositories. Uh -huh. <laughs> so well, it's I, I think it's definitely I think it's bigger <laughs> than just good news. Like F Droid yeah. can now become like a huge thing. Huge right thing. now, it's it's a very niche thing where you're like super geeks use F Droid. Uh, namely, anybody that listens to Linux Out Loud or Destination Linux, you know they're the F Droid audience. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, <laughs> when you when you have this opened up and it becomes more mainstream, uh, I think F Droid could become the go to market on all Android devices. For instance, like it's possible um, if Google makes enough mistakes in how their app store is implemented, right. or people were concerned enough about their security or privacy. And by the way, did you all see Apple running a very expensive? Well shot ad, and the whole ad is cameras flying on wings spying on you. Oh and, yeah, and yeah. It's, and it basically says like, "Come to Apple, yeah. we don't spy on you." And I'm <laughs> like, very "Listen, <laughs> brilliant." And why this matters is to this day there are people that you know I either work with or that I come across in the streets, and we're mm -hmm. talking tech, and and they they kind of they kind of you know, laugh a little bit about the whole, like, oh yeah, you're a privacy person. You're really big into that privacy stuff. And they almost treat it like I'm this niche thing. Mm. And I'm like, if Apple is spending hundreds of millions of dollars on ads, they did a billboard, they've done full page newspaper articles. Now they're running full commercials on it. Clearly privacy is not just a niche geek thing yeah. that just a couple people want. Mm -hmm. It's a really important thing that Apple thinks is so important, by the way, that they're spending their entire advertising, not on their new phone coming up or not on the new app store or anything else, but just saying, hey, look, we're more private than Android. And that to me says that they realize in their market research that there's a lot of people who actually care about that kind of thing. And I think a lot of this generation coming up who've been victims of these all of these hacks of their privacy being violated, their photos being exposed or whatever has happened, their messages being exposed, the cancel things that go on because of messages they didn't intend to get out, the get out, all of this stuff happening is making people probably this generation stop and go, you know what? Maybe I kind of do care about that privacy thing after all. I don't know. That's my hope anyways. And Apple seems to be pushing that envelope there. So I'm happy to see that. Although I don't want Apple to be the main solution. It's just, I'm happy yeah. somebody's pushing the privacy <laughs> message. So no I wonder if some of that 600 million could be going to Google actually having to pull Google Play services out of some of those apps or being able to run certain things to make it accessible for those third-party apps to run properly on specific yeah. things. Possibly, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, obviously it's going to be far more integrated into mm -hmm. the software if they're having to spend this much money. And they're saying it's going to take 12 to 16 months for the changes. Um, the judge, according to the article, didn't seem to be as concerned with how long it was going to take. But they did say 
let's not be ridiculous. You've got a lot of really smart people out there right. that can get this stuff done pretty quickly. So we won't know what the final judgment will be on how fast they're going to have to get it done. But my guess is it won't be any longer than that 12 to 16 month range that will be allowed. Um, but this is good. This is good for F Droid. This is good for other third party apps. And I think this is going to force Google Play Store to innovate. And it's going to force Woo-hoo. them, right? If they want to still compete, yeah. now they have competition. Now you can't do things like say, hey, let the app developer tell you what they're going to steal and what they don't. We don't want yeah. any part of that. Like they're going to, if they want to really be like, hey, you need to use the Play Store, they're going to have to make that case actually viable now. Uh, whereas before they didn't have to. And I think that's a win for everybody, whether you use the, the third party app store or not, mm-hmm. it's going to be a win for everyone. All right, Jill, uh, mm-hmm. I gave Wendy that super happy article. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Poor uh, Wendy. <laughs> and okay. uh, I gave you a super happy game too to go in here. Yeah. Actually, this isn't a bad game, actually. I usually give you a horror game or something, but this time I didn't. Well, what do we got? It's a little bit on the horror side, but oh, is it? Okay, <laughs> yeah. I remember. Um, so you know, Michael often pretends to be a ninja in his spare time. You saw that too? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so he I has nunchucks and a mask and you may see him parkouring between bushes if you live near him. Yeah. Report him and- to the police if you see him uh, parkouring <laughs> between your bushes at night. Yes. But- <laughs> <laughs> so our game this week will let him learn some new ninja moves. Finally. It's called Mute Crimson DX. And it's described on Steam like this. Mute Crimson DX is an action-packed precision platformer where you guide Ninja on his quest to climb up walls, slice through bad guys, and overcome great evils. Hmm. His name's Ninja, Jill? Yeah. His (laughs) parents were like, they knew when he was born what he was going to be. Yes. Ninja named Ninja. You're going to be a ninja. We're going to name you Ninja. You're You're just Ninja. Yes, absolutely. So the game actually has nine worlds of carefully crafted ninja platforming and really intense boss fights. I was dying a lot because (laughs) there's some really good (laughs) boss fights. But there is a cool feature that our very own Michael will love. If he dies, he can rewind at any time Mm -hmm. and go back and try and kill the monster or or go over the obstacle. That's a win. That's a big win. But if he doesn't want to use this feature, uh, you can uh, actually turn it off and have it in hard mode. Nice. No no, uh, time travel necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Well, he is like a third tier Crayola level in Rocket League or whatever they call it. (laughs) He is. Yeah. Yeah. He's very so, high up, so he, he might go hardcore mode. Yeah, he'll he, he'd actually be very good at this game. Mm-hmm. Um, the game has a beautiful, artful, stylish, limited color pal- palette. It goes from black to white and red, and it has a marvelous old school chiptune soundtrack that really immerses you in the action. That was one of my favorite things about the game is I love the soundtrack, mm. as as well as a fun story delivered through full screen hand-drawn cut scenes which are beautifully done and there are collectibles and hidden secrets to unlock extra game modes and and lots of other fun stuff and if you like nintendo nes classic action platformers then you will definitely enjoy this game (laughs) it definitely has that feel and it's only 14 dollars 99 on steam and supports our linux penguins out of the box and once again, that's Mute Crimson DX. Now, is this like the the soundtrack that you said was your favorite part? Is this like the 8-bit sound? Yeah. Or, oh. Like the 8-bit music, yeah. Are yeah, you a big fan tunes. of that, when, uh, Wendy? Mm-hmm. The 8-bit? I wouldn't say I'm a big fan of it. I don't hate it, uh-huh. but I don't go out of my way to listen to it either. Okay. And Jill, <laughs> what about you? Yeah, so I actually um, I've I've played a lot of chip tunes on my radio show years ago. Chip like tunes? when it was is that what it's called? Yeah, chip yeah. <laughs> Cute. Cute. <laughs> so many years ago, like in the the late eighties and early nineties, it was starting to become a thing. The chip tunes, huh. and I played right. electronic synth music. 
So I would incorporate chip tunes as you know, new artists were, for instance, manipulating old uh, Game Boys and old PlayStations. That's how a lot of the music is is made in the chip tune circuit. <laughs> they use old consoles and have fun, and of course, computers too. But yeah, the Nintendo, you know, they they drew a lot a lot from the artists that I ended I was actually playing. <laughs> so well, nice. what's amazing about that music is, you know, originally it was because you had this limitation on space and absolutely. And, yeah. And the amount of storage that you had available to put these songs and tracks on and the type of music you could play through it. And so it was like amazing some of the themes, like when you think of Zelda or Mario and other mm-hmm. things that stuck with us through all these years that were just these eight bit tracks. And I never appreciated it uh, uh, growing up and even, you know, as a teenager and things. But I came across the streamer. And I've told this story a long time ago on the show, but uh, man versus game. I don't even think they stream anymore. But he was so into he was just geeking out over this 8-bit soundtrack of a game one time. And he was just talking about like all of the amazing sounds they were able to create with this limitation mm-hmm. And by the time it was done, I was like in my car listening to 8-bit soundtracks because yeah. I just love when people <laughs> geek out. If somebody's geeking out and excited about things these days, I'm am- I'm immediately going to take it on. I'm like, oh. yeah, let's do this. I'm, I'm all on board. So I got a little addicted to the 8-bit soundtracks and they're, they're just amazing to listen to when you kind of realize the limitations that they have. Now, we don't have those anymore and they can do some more fancy things with that 8-bit sound, but it's still amazing to that what they accomplished with that stuff the programming was incredible and the musicians were incredible for what they had to work with what's what was really awesome is i got to see um uh the the chiptune music festivals at the maker fair and that was fantastic you know that was when the music was new and everyone's you know geeking out hacking all their consoles and and making the sounds using you know nintendo 64s and (laughs) and it was just and ataris and it was really, really awesome. And one point I want to want to make about that, Ryan, you touched on this. One of my favorite genres of music is uh, tracker music. It was created um, um, from uh, the Amiga uh, users uh, created uh, tracker music, and those files are are very tiny. Sometimes they're only three hundred kilobytes bytes or 20 kilobytes and you can get over an hour of that music on a floppy disk oh my gosh (laughs) and i played on my radio show i played they were dot mods or dot s3ms those were were very popular tracker uh, of file formats well those are the file formats that a lot of these artists are using (laughs) to create the chiptune music and it's the file format used in a lot of games, especially uh, games that are that are um, small in size. Yeah. They'll put they'll put these uh, files in it. So it's been uh, they got they got popularized on the BBSs back in the eighties and early nineties, and I I became friends with some of the artists, and that that was just an amazing period in music mm-hmm. <laughs> with the computer and. And um, all this manipulation. I got a new idea here. I'm telling (laughs) you, this is a million dollar idea. Okay. We get Jill, patron only. She'll DJ music. We'll pick a couple days a week where she (laughs) DJs music. And you can tune in to Jill DJing (laughs) some of her electronic music with the 8 bit. Oh my God. I would pay pay so much money to do that, to just listen to you (laughs) DJ. Because I bet it was so. Uh, special and exciting because you geek yeah. out over everything, Jill. Yes. And that makes it's just, <laughs> it's infectious when somebody's excited about something. Um, so I think that's our million dollar idea. We got to get you to DJ Aww. at some point. <laughs> uh, if all those stupid licensing would get not get in our way. Yeah, could, that's a little bit of the problem. <laughs> right. Fun stuff like that. <laughs> All right. So Jill, let's say that uh, I'm a little disappointed in Firefox. I'm looking for an alternative browser. What should I be checking out? Oh gosh, this is one of my favorite web browsers called Fire Dragon. Mm, Fire like Dragon me. is a browser based on the Florp browser. It was customized to have dragonized or DR four sixty nized fitting aesthetics for the Arch based Garuda Linux. Love one of my Garuda. favorite Arch based yeah. uh, uh, Linuxes uh, that we've talked about heavily here on the show. Rightfully and so. Yeah, and and this browser was originally actually a LibreWolf fo- uh, fork, and they continued integrating patches and tweaks 
in, in the base, which is really awesome. And there's so many privacy respecting features in Fire Dragon. One is the inclusion of the Cirex and Google search engines. Yes. With the possibility to run locally. I remember R- Ryan set up a Cirex right. uh, instance. Yes, I did. And the default search engine is Garuda's Cirex instance. And it's one of my favorite search engines because it's open source and privacy respecting. And of course, that's one of the reasons why Ryan wanted to use it. 100%. And it's a, it does a great job. It might be a little slower when you, you put in your searches, but but boy, you don't have to worry about ads. You get you you find what you want. Mm, yeah, <laughs> there's nice. no <laughs> manipulation to yeah. the results. And Cirx lets you do all the customization and things that you want. So eventually you kind of get your own personal search engine for how you like to look at things. The weakness in it is images. So if you're looking for images and things, you probably want to put that uh, exclamation mark G or something in front of it to pull from Google or Bing or whatever. Cause they, it's just, Mm -hmm. that's where it kind of falls short, which makes sense because it's, it's a open source um, search engine that doesn't have the same resources to go and scrub all of that stuff and things. But outside of that, I'm going to say you're going to get better results in a lot of cases using Cirx yeah. than you're going to with the major search engines, which, by the way, what is Google doing to their search engine? Have you actually I Googled know. something recently? It's like five layers of ads. Before, it'd be like yeah, one ad that one. was clearly an ad, and then below it would be your search results. Now it's like I can't <laughs> tell where the search results begin and the ads stop. It's unbelievably bad. And half the time your search is like on the third page. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they are horrible. just ruining themselves. Like, yeah. I don't know what's going on. That's crazy. So Come on, Google. Cirex or Cirx. <laughs> or Duck um, uh, also, uh, Fire Dragon has the awesome Dark Raider and Ublock Origin Firefox yes. add-ins yeah. installed by default, which we all love and use. Mm-hmm. And a nice neon cyberpunk theme throughout and custom dragonized branding with Beautiful artwork by at SGC. It is beautiful artwork. It Their is. logos are first class. They yeah. look so cool with the purple black fire dragon. Like they look dope. Yeah. Amazing. Love it. So sweet. And yeah, we, me and Ryan both like uh, cyberpunk and cyberpunk yeah. punk games. So <laughs> we were all excited about it. Firefox uh, accounts are enabled using a custom self-hosted sync server, which is really nice. They have their own ffsync.grudalinux.org. And Fire Dragon also has faster web page loading from custom Fire Dragon settings and the inclusion of fast fox tweets, which I love. Tweaks, <laughs> fast fox tweaks, tweets. <laughs> no, this is not X. <laughs> <laughs> do you tweet on X anymore? What do you do on X? You just post. Post. It's, oh, that's it, so lame. Like everyone what? else. I know. It's so mundane. You hit post. <laughs> tweet was way better. And, and Mastodon's are, was the dumbest, though. Two is the uh, yeah, dumbest. Yeah, no, they don't have that, that anymore. Yeah. But that was yeah. the dumbest. It was. That was. That's not their thing anymore. <laughs> but yeah. Anyways. Well, Fire Dragon also has has uh, hidden navigation buttons instead of being grayed out when they aren't active, which I really appreciate it because it, it really creates a, a, a clean UI. Mm. And you can spoof Chrome on Windows through Floops, Florps, <laughs> excuse me, I thought that name for Florp. my browser, Florps, <laughs> Florp. <laughs> user user Florp's agent user. switcher. Yes. I like that. That's the cool. The user agent sw- switcher when not using fingerprinting. And it includes private browsing mode security, which nice. we all love here on Destination Linux. Yes. And Linux Out Loud. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, very important. Very much. And it's actually available as a flat pack over at flatpack.org or as an app mi- image mm-hmm. or as a tarball or from the Arch AUR. But actually, recently, I used Fire Dragon on my laptop. Um, of course, that is running Garuda Linux. But I also installed it on my NixOS computer rig as a Fire Dragon Flake. Nice. Yeah. You can do it there, too. <laughs> I really like it. I, I think it's a fantastic browser. If you're looking for something a little bit different that's really stylized, got a lot of great options in there. Definitely yeah. check it out. By the way, Google is being sued also for their private private browsing. When you mentioned the private browsing, oh thing, yeah, you hear about that? They're being uh, they're going to have to delete the 180 million 
records or whatever that they collected yes. while people clicked the private browsing mode I and know. thought that they were actually not privately so browsing. Private. Yeah, not yeah. so private. That's why Firefox is good for private browsing. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Come on, Firefox. Wake up. <laughs> wake up, Firefox. You could do better. All right. Well, this has been an amazing show. Thank you again, Wendy, for coming and subbing for Michael. I mean, yeah. if this accidentally became permanent, I wouldn't cry. <laughs> uh, but a big thank you. No, I would. I'm, I, I love you. No, I don't Aww. I, you're okay, Michael. <laughs> have you, anyways, a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, we love your faces. You can come join us on Discord by going to tuxdigital.com slash Discord. And if you want to watch this show live, you can become a patron of Destination Linux and talk about things like the Meshtastic that I mm -hmm. geek out with in the after show. And yeah. then and then I go and buy it. And it's just, I blame it on you guys. Then I tell my <laughs> wife why I spent the money. And that's one of the advantages of being patrons. I blame you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, that's just one of the many perks that you get being a patron. You get blamed by Ryan when he buys stuff. Absolutely yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You also get that perk of that patron only post show. So you get to see lots of fun stuff in the edited version, but there's so much more additional banter. We have lots of fun. You should come check it out. If you want to become a membership, go to tuxdigital.com slash membership to sign up. If you want to support the show in other ways, you can check out the Tux Digital merch store. You can click on a link in the show description. There's <laughs> lots of great stuff like some hoodies, <laughs> mugs, all kinds of fun stuff. Nothing that's Ryan's holding. He didn't put Batman away from last week. Bad Ryan. <laughs> didn't put Batman away. Nice call. I didn't put oh. my toys away. I didn't yes, put them back didn't. in the toy box. You didn't. Oh, man. And make sure to check out all the incredible shows here on Tux Digital. That's right. We have an entire network of shows to fill your whole week with gooky geekness. Good job, Jill. <laughs> So check out Linux Out Loud, where you can watch the beautiful and amazing Wendy on her show with Matt and Nate having a blast and sharing their passion for Linux and open source. And I love the at last episode with Bill. That was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was so much fun. The weird thing is, is Matt couldn't make it because of work and Nate was going to make it. Matt goes, hey, just shoot Bill a message, see if he can join in. And I'm so glad I did. Right. Not only is Bill from... Sudo show, a ton of fun. Yes. But Nate was unable to make it too. So that's why it just became the two of us. Last no. minute things mm -hmm. changed and we got a Wendy and Bill only show. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> and everyone head to textizzle.com and subscribe to all our great shows. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching in the full monte of Linux and open source awesome sauce. Everybody have a great week and remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks everyone. Oh, I was laughing at myself all. a little bit because I had to read the notes. I'm like, why am I reading the notes? I've done this 300 <laughs> times. I've done this <laughs> 300 times. Like my brain's like, no, look at the note. You might forget. <laughs> Like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Shut the patrons off. How oh, dare they? By the way, Alex, have you figured out how to use this thing yet? <laughs> All right, we'll get to it. <laughs> See you next week, everyone. Jeez. Stop the recording. Stop the recording. Stop the recording. We don't want to hear this. You doing stuff. 